начинаем. Ну ладно. Да. Здравствуйте, уважаемые коллеги, наши немногочисленные Hello, слушатели. Colleagues. Надеюсь, что те, кто пьет кофе, тоже нас слушает. Зрители and, онлайн. Uh, I'd like to welcome all the online viewers and listeners as well. Uh, we are ready to open the legal session of the TLD conference. Uh, there have always been a lot of uh, legal disputes around domain uh, domain names. At the end of May 2024, the Supreme Court of Russia uh, adopted the review of legal cases related to violation of copyright and just and rights online. There is a separate chapter there on uh, websites uh, owners and whether these are considered to be information mediators as they are known the Russian law. And, um, you will be a spoiler now, I understand that, but uh, you don't need, they, they are not considered to be information intermediaries. Uh, that's a procedure to block the mirror sites. Uh, it used to be the um, now it's Roskomnadzor that will be blocking these websites. It's a new procedure. And it seems that everyone now is discussing uh, Vladislav Bokarchuk's claim for the Wamperi's domain name. The, uh, his, uh, his lawyers are claiming that since the domain name was registered while uh, the uh, Bokarchuk spouses were still married, then uh, the domain name should also be split as common uh, property of a spouse. Houses. Several years ago, at TLD Corn, uh, we had a discussion of whether a domain name uh, should be considered a property or not. I remember I was moderating that session. We also talked about whether domain names can be inherited. It would be very curious to hear from our colleagues in Belarus and learn how Belarus regulates inheritance of the domain name. Please welcome Natalia Kosyak, head of the legal department at Hoster BY. Good afternoon, my name is Natalia. I am a head of the legal department at Hoster BY. I will open the single session about with a topic that's um, that's that's not too complicated. We'll talk about the inheritance of uh, domain names administration uh, in Belarus. We know that domain names uh, causes many uh, cause many disputes. Over here, you can see four main categories uh, to which domain names are or into which domain names are usually categorized. The domain name, as some um, theoreticians say, is a means of uh, uh, visual identity. A domain name is unique, and uh, to register two similar domain names in the same domain area, or the same domain names in the same domain area, is not possible. At the same time, uh, domain names are regional. Uh, some owners of the domain names, some registrants use uh, long domain names. The uh, the uh, express uh, their creativity through the domain name and um, it's a unique um, address um, online uh, and therefore a domain name has uh, the feature of uniqueness uh, back in 2007 it was also discussed uh, that um, uh, domain names are not the same as a trademark, and very often uh, disputes around the domain names are still initiated by the trademark owners. The institution of trademark owners um, comes with thousands of years of history uh, with the brands uh, that were used to identify products of uh, various uh, Artifices in Belarus courts, whenever there is a case tried uh, between the trademark and the domain name, usually a uh, trademark is uh, treated in the same fashion as the domain name, and the courts would consider the similarity or confusing similarity between the two, and the uh, court will also classify the industries and the markets. 
in which the litigants operate. Usually, the courts would not say that the domain name is the only means of uh, visual identity of the product online because a domain name is considered to be a property. Uh, there were several cases in the European Court of Human Rights and also in the American um, court system where the domain name was treated as property. There are several court resolutions where a domain name is um, included into the property of an enterprise or uh, is included in the list of titles. And in Russia, we also had such cases. But in Belarus, the legal nature of a domain name as an object of civil law is still not settled. Since the domain is a valuable asset, we all agree with that. Now, the question arises, how can the rights uh, to the domain name be transferred in the process of inheritance? What if Leo Tolstoy would have a domain uh, with uh, a personal blog or, say, a popular actor in the 1990s, if they had a, an online blog with photographs, probably the uh, successors uh, would be fighting uh, for the domain name, and very often domain names now are included into the estate, and domain names are taken out of this gray uh, zone over here. You can see a case uh, involving a German hosting company in the FAQ section of this German company. They describe the procedure of inheriting the domain name. You can uh, present the resolution of the court, identifying you as the uh, successor, or you can uh, bring in the actual will. Uh, uh, to this company for the domain name to be transferred uh, to you. But um, it's still not clear what to do if there are several successes, and, uh, several heirs. There is uh, an interesting rule in the rules of the Estonian Internet Foundation. What it says there is the domain name cannot belong to several successors. Should that be the case, other successors will have to waive the right to the domain name uh, for the benefit of just one successor. And together with the other documents, you have to also submit the certificate to inheritance uh, uh, the certificate of marriage or certificate of birth uh, are not enough to inherit the domain name. Estonian rules also say that the domain name can uh, be inherited only six months after the death of the owner. The registrar will send the notice uh, or notification to the last known contacts of the owner of the uh, domain uh, name. And it uh, 30 days are given to the successors uh, to present the required documents, otherwise the domain name will be cancelled. In Russia, domain is treated often as a service which is connected to the personality of the creditor, for instance, uh, the uh, registrant. The service is interrupted with the death of the uh, registrant, and according to the civil law, it can be inherited. But the registrants now have the right to determine for themselves a certain procedure or an algorithm that would enable uh, the uh, for them to pass the uh, domain name to the successors of the deceased person. However, the procedure of inheriting a domain name should not depend on uh, just the will of the registrar, on the procedure of the registrar, on the whim of the registrar, even, uh, and a tripartite uh, agreement between the registrar, the uh, registrant, and the future uh, successor is not uh, certified by a notary public. So it would be best if there would be some regulatory uh, governance of this procedure. What about Belarus? For the first time, the matter of inheriting a domain name, uh, and uh, actually this uh, whole procedure was made um, possible on the 1st of March 2017, it happened when during another, uh, well, when uh, amendments were introduced to the instruction on registration of domain names. 
the matter of the legal nature of the domain name was uh, set aside. It was never resolved. But the Ministry of Justice and other relevant authorities uh, agreed that domain names uh, should be included into the estate and the right to administer domain names is not interrupted with the death of the registrant. So the registration rights uh, can or should be included into the estate. At first, the successors could submit documents during the time of the uh, domain name registration or within 30 days after the domain name was uh, annulled. We are the largest uh, registrar. We have many customers. It comes with a downside. We lose customers because they die, among other things. And we had many cases when domain when successors would like to inherit the domain name. In June last year, we received yet another request, another application with the documents, and the successors could not agree on who should uh, inherit the domain name. There were two successors. Both of them uh, claimed the domain name, and they were very scandalous persons. So we initiated a re uh, request to the Ministry of Justice. Uh, we asked them to develop uniform practice. We wanted all registrars to understand what to do if there are several successors, if all the successors come to the office uh, with uh, relevant documents. We'd like to thank colleagues from the analytical center who did an excellent uh, outreach with the Ministry of Justice and with the Association of uh, Notaries Public. They explained what domains were to the authorities, and as a result, uh, well, at no, least we stop the practice of issuing certificates to inheritance to the domain names instead of the inheritance of the right to administer domain names. However, there was a lot of discrepant practice uh, between different notaries public when they issue uh, the certificate of inheritance. Notaries public would give out the certificates in accordance with the will or in accordance with the legislation to all the uh, successors. And they never saw any problem with that. Uh, and just like successors need to come to a compromise, the registrars, the regulators, the notaries public, they also had to come to a kind of an agreement, to a compromise. The right to administer domain names are indivisible. The authorities agreed with that. It means that they should belong to just one successor. And the current instruction now contains this norm that the rights to administer a domain name can be transferred to only one successor. But even that is not enough. There is a general rule that wasn't changed. The certificate of inheritance is issued uh, six months after the day of death of uh, that person, of the registrant. It's very uh, likely that the domain name registration will expire by that time. Having analyzed the request that we were receiving and the certificates of inheritance that we were receiving, we saw that at least one third of all the certificates of inheritance would not be issued within the, that initial period of time, within the first six months. Uh, if not all uh, successors are identified on time, if they haven't showed up 
to get the certificates. The, during that time, the registrar may suspend the domain name, and sometimes the domain name will be claimed beyond the established period of time. All of this uh, leads to extending the, uh, I mean, the, extending the whole process. It takes too much time. So the time frame that was envisaged by the previous version of this instruction, the period of registration plus 30 days, was uh, deemed to be insufficient. At the same time, we had to settle uh, for some reasonable period of time, and nine months was selected. In Estonia, it's six months plus 30 days, but we decided that nine months is reasonable for the successors to remember that there was this piece of property, which is a domain name, which is the right to administer domain name, so the uh, registrars will suspend delegation of the domain, which is an excellent trigger for all the successes to go and collect the certificate of inheritance. At the same time, the uh, successor will get all the paperwork done. The successors will be able to decide between themselves who is going to inherit the right to administer. So basically, nine months is enough uh, for us to process these claims. But since we are all about business and registrar's work will not be interrupted uh, for the time uh, during which the successors will uh, comply with all the bureaucratic procedures. So if by the time of death, the domain name was renewed or it was renewed recently and um, there are still nine months um, of validity, nothing happens to the domain name. It will continue to be registered and delegated. If the domain name was registered a long time ago and the registrants did not renew the contract and the contract is about to expire, then this nine months period will kick in since uh, starting from the day of the registrant's death. Consequently, since during that time the registrars will process requests from the successors, they will analyze the certificate of inheritance that we will get from the successors. We will have to consult with the notary's public because the notary is still not clear as to what they should write in the certificate of inheritance. The decision was taken that since we renew or rather extend the period of registration, we give you time to uh, become uh, successors, legal successors. Well, as soon as you decide that you will uh, keep the domain name, then the successor will have to uh, pay extra uh, in a proportion to the time period that expired since the uh, well, the, basically, the, the successors will have to cover the costs associated with the time period uh, after the expiration of the domain name registration until the time that the, the domain name is transferred to the new registrant. Usually, the calculation of that period and the payment is not a problem. Uh, and this regulation on how to calculate the extra payment, the extra, extra charge, was implemented to uh, facilitate the operations of the business. This is now part of the uh, current version of the instruction on the registration of the domain names. It's possible to uh, renew the delegation of the domain names for the period of succession. This can be done at the notary public. Uh, the uh, trustee uh, uh, can act on behalf of the successor. Uh, and what do we do if there are more than one uh, successors? 
Запросы мнения предложили рассматривать и провести аналогию с долевой собственностью, в результате чего в настоящее время... Our suggestion was to introduce the concept of shared property, but still the successors will have to decide who will be the registrant. This uh, agreement should be made in writing. And it should be submitted to the notary's public before the certificates of inheritance are handed out. The registrar is not party to this agreement. The agreement is certified by the notary public, and the successors will have to uh, submit these documents to us. We think that domain names should be inherited, that the procedure should be transparent and clear, that the whole procedure should not be in the gray area, it shouldn't be an extra service from the registrar, it should be regulated. We know that domains are a valuable asset, and that's why they can and should make up part of the estate. Thank you. Thank you, Natalia. I have a question. What do we do if there are no successes? Uh, no successes, uh, then uh, this, uh, this estate will pass uh, to the state, to the government. Do you have any cases like that? If there are no successes, then um, if this can be confirmed, if, if we can confirm the fact of death of the registrant, and we don't know whether there are any successes, then we will send out notifications in writing and digitally that the domain name registration is suspended. You have that much time to submit the documents. If the time uh, passes by and uh, no one presents themselves, then the domain name will be uh, undelegated. It will be uh, cancelled on the uh, general rules. And yes, uh, you can ask questions. Uh, do we have a microphone in the room? Who is going to help us with the mic? Because there is a question. Okay, here is the microphone. By the way, this is a very important topic for all registries. I'm not a lawyer myself, but I've been talking to lawyers. From what I know, a domain name is not property. It's not property. Because as soon as the domain name registration expires, the domain name is available for a new registration. It's like a, a contract, contract of hire. The domain basically belongs to the registry. You don't pay for the domain name. Uh, it's back into free circulation. Well, well, well. Um, now, from the perspective of the, of the of civil law, no, domain name is not uh, mentioned in the civil code, but uh, uh, in our practice, a domain name is not uh, inalienable from the uh, identity of the deceased person. That's why it can be transferred. The practice says that it is property. One letter domain, so we stopped registering them uh, uh, from 2018. But the last registration was paid for for five years. And we don't know what happened to this person. We don't know whether this person's alive. He paid uh, in advance for five years. How do you find out that someone is deceased? Well, first of all, you, you can't pay uh, uh, five years a year. It's only two years. It's a shorter period of time. We asked uh, from the government uh, for the registrars uh, the right to get access to the database of uh, individuals uh, 
We were denied this request, but uh, we had several cases when competitors would contact us. They were the first to learn that the owner of this domain name died. We haven't heard from the successors yet, but we uh, had a visit from a lawyer who represented the competitor of that uh, domain uh, name registrant. But usually, um, people uh, know that domain names are valuable. They uh, recall that the deceased person had a domain name. Sometimes people wouldn't know, but sometimes they would even uh, try to find out uh, for sure that uh, such and such person used to be the registrant of such and such domain names. Okay, and my third question is, in Armenia, according to our policy, uh, the domain uh, expires not at the time when the uh, registrant dies, but it will uh, be active for as long as it was paid for. So if something happens to this domain name, who is controlling the domain names, the logins, the passwords, someone who got access to the computer, uh, well, we actually had um, a dispute between the mother of the deceased person and the spouse of the deceased person. The spouse uh, had access to the computer of this deceased gentleman, and she we could control the domain name because she had access to all the passwords. But according to the certificate of um, uh, inheritance, she only had a one half share to the uh, domain. And every second day, we would have a visit from either the mother or the wife. And unfortunately, they couldn't come to an agreement. And they, they couldn't settle this dispute through an amicable uh, settlement. So when we learned that the uh, registrant deceased, it was uh, he was the owner of a large business, it was a logistics business, the domain name was suspended. Tourist businesses, you know, family businesses. Um, yeah, it's a problem, I agree. Okay, thank you very much. And thank you for answering my questions. I just wanted to mention that in Armenia, uh, we have the concept of registrar as goodwill. So the person who brings the certificate of death, if it's the wife, then we will also request the certificate of marriage and the successors, it's still not clear. Uh, at first we would uh, give the or re-register re the domain name and the name of the first uh, successor to reach us. But yeah, but uh, we were not happy with the solution. Exactly. It's not a perfect solution. It's, it's not fair. And uh, when we were talking to colleagues, I got scared because uh, it feels like uh, only our customers die. But we have such a big customer base. We have so many registrants, and of course, it would be only natural that we had many cases like that. And I also that there is a comment in the room. It's not a question, it's, a, it's an answer. Well, since you are, uh, well, we are discussing technical issues, but there is also the technical component so that the notaries have an information system that is integrated with the uh, with the uh, government information system, and at the moment we are working on the service. It should be launched sometime in October. It's work in progress, right? So the question is in uh, transferring information. On the one hand, the notary public cannot tell us directly that this person died because it's a secret. But when the notaries uh, open up the inheritance case, then a certain request is entered into the government system and the system, the register, will 
launch a business process that we described in terms of notifying the registrants that from starting from this date, because the notary uh, will have to answer the date of uh, issue of the certificate of death, and uh, uh, a notification will be sent to the registrants. Uh, and on the technical side, the procedure will be started automatically should the successes identify themselves to us. So the quality of the data and the relevance of the data, or how updated the data is, uh, it's one of the more, uh, you know, it's, it's a crucial issue. It's an, it's an essential uh, part of the whole process. So it means that the registrars will be able to get information as well based on the date of uh, the certificate of this. Well, since we do not check data of the registrants, yes, I know about ECIA, the unified system of uh, identification, but sometimes domain names are registered in the name of uh, non-existent persons. Uh, there was a case uh, once in my practice during the court trial, we found out that the owner of the domain name of the, the registrant uh, was no longer among the living. And then we had to switch from a civil case to an inheritance case, from a business dispute to inheritance dispute. Please raise your hand if you think that the domain names or the rights to the uh, administration of the domain names should be inherited. Not too many hands. Uh, well, that's very interesting. We can continue the discussion outside of the uh, session. Let's uh, switch now to our next topic. There are many uh, battles around the domain names. No system is perfect, and Elizabeth Ignatov is going to uh, talk to us about the UDRP um, dispute settlement. Uh, Elizabeth is the advisor, legal advisor uh, to Runity. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Ignatovich, and I uh, represent uh, Track Ru at Runity. We are part of the Runity group of companies. I'm in charge of claims and uh, uh, um, legal assistance at Runity. About three and a half uh, million domain names are registered by REC.RU. Uh, about uh, half, four and a half thousand are registered in that RF and the rest uh, are within other domain areas. That's why we offer 760 domain areas, domain zones, and that's why we study policies of register operators in different zones. Today we'll be talking about relevant issues of a dispute settlement under UDRP. We'll talk, among other things, about, about uh, resolution enforcement. You know that there are court procedures to settle disputes. You can apply to national courts, but usually it takes a long time, between one year to three years, to settle a dispute. There is <clears throat> no clear regulation of such disputes. There is uh, ambiguity and uh, inconsistency in the enforcement of the decisions. As to UDRP, it is an out-of-court procedure. It is fast, two to four months. The regulation is very clear. It's described in the rules and the policies, and the uh, decision is uh, uh, binding upon the registrar. We'll take a look at the uh, pros and cons of both procedures. UDRP applies to all ICANN accredited registrars. This policy applies to registrars and to registrants. This is part of the uh, um, offer to register domain name. It also applies to GTLD and new GTLD. The basis to consider a domain trial under UTRP is 
based on uh, three, uh, well, three reasons. The, uh, the domain name is likely to be confused with existing domain names, no rights of the registrant to register the domain name, uh, or cyber squatting and uh, offering services uh, and uh, selling goods without uh, the permission of the rights holder. This is when a domain name is used in a bad faith. In all these three cases, uh, UDRP can be um, engaged. After the Arbitration Commission considers the case, one of the following decisions can be taken. The domain name is transferred uh, to the claimant. The domain name is kept in the name of the registrant, or the domain name is cancelled. In most cases, the domain name will be transferred by the registrar to the rights holder. Most of the decisions of the Arbitration Commission will ask for that. And the registrar has 10 days to comply with this decision unless a claim is submitted to the National Court. And at this stage, certain problems may arise. In particular, there may be a problem with enforcement. If a claim is submitted to the National Court, then the registrar will not comply with the decision of the Arbitration Commission. The UDRP policy doesn't state clearly when the registrar should um, comply with this decision. The policy does not uh, also describe the evidence that will satisfy the registrar for it to comply with the contested UDRP decision. The Arbitration Commission stops acting when the decision, its decision, its resolution, is sent out to the parties, to the case. The Arbitration Commission's decision can be challenged in foreign courts, hence the problem of enforcing foreign courts' decisions in the country, say, the country is Russia, the Russian registrar is not obliged to comply with the decisions of foreign courts. This is stated in the Russian Civil Code. UDRP doesn't provide for any appeal procedure. However, a repeated claim can be submitted. And the reasons to repeat the, uh, a claim are also limited and they are stated in the UDRP. For instance, if there is new evidence which was not available during the first consideration of the case. Challenging UDRP decisions in national courts is the problem of claim the, uh, that, that could be uh, imposed upon the registrar if there is a claim against the registrar to transfer the domain name, the registrar will not have to comply with this decision, and the rights holders will uh, then be able to enforce the decision through bailiffs. But uh, practice shows that at the stage of enforcement, it's not always possible to uh, fulfill the decision of the court because the domain name at uh, that time may have already been um, cancelled or transferred to a third party. 
Besides, there is an equality between the DRP decision status and the national court decision status. The registrar is obliged to comply with UDRP decisions because this is a part of the ICANN accreditation agreement. Should the registrar fail to comply with the Arbitration Commission decision, and the registrars uh, receive 200, 300 uh, decisions uh, from the Arbitration Commission annually, and if the registrar doesn't comply with the four, say five such decisions, the registration may be evoked or may, may be um, uh, revoked. Uh, sometimes the registrars will also uh, contest the uh, decisions that uh, initially they were not happy with. And this procedure is possible through national courts. So again, you can see that there is inequality uh, in the enforcement of the decisions of uh, the Arbitration Commission and of the national courts. However, UDRP is uh, the most workable and efficient mechanism for the rights holders if a trademark is violated by the domain name. Thank you. If you have any questions from the floor, then please uh, get close to the microphone. I will be able to see you then and give you the floor. And if there are no questions from the room, then I will ask the speakers some questions. You said that there are some advantages of the UDRP system, and of course, it's not a perfect system. It's not clear how to enforce this decision, especially in Russia. We know that uh, there are problems with enforcement forcing UDRP decisions in Russia. So my question to you is that of a lawyer, for instance, a UDRP may apply in a case, or you can take the case to, uh, to the court. What would you prefer? Would you choose UDRP or would you personally choose a uh, court? Well, yes. Uh, we, uh, okay, I should have said that we are discussing, say, an international domain within .com, for instance. And if you are a trademark uh, um, owner, we know that uh, there is a charge to use this procedure, two, three thousand dollars. But I would definitely recommend uh, uh, for you to uh, rec uh, rec recourse uh, to the UDRP procedure rather than national courts. Because in national courts, the practice is very unstable. And like I said, the registrars will not uh, always comply with this decision. I mean, the uh, national arbitration decision. Uh, so I will uh, for UDRP. Well, since you mentioned prices, you know that uh, court fees were raised recently in order to uh, complain to the Supreme Court the court fees about 80,000 uh, rubles. The price is very high. Our next presentation is on innovations in uh, in the domain industry. And our next speaker is Yekaterina Yevtieva. She is a legal advisor to uh, cctlt.ru.rf. There are two parts in my presentation. I think both of them are relevant. Let's start with the court practice uh, related to the transfer of the right of administration. The practice accumulates year by year, and on a scheme, this is how the relations between the parties can be described. 
видим, что когда that... передается право на домен от одного администратора к другому, when the rights are transferred from one registrant to another, it often happens not under the rules of the registry, not under the rules of cctlt.ru, and it's not the same uh, procedure that the registrants set up for their domain names. Registrant notifies the registrar in, uh, with a notification that is uh, non-conformant, Но в какой-то момент, вот я пометила, что администратор, он в кавычках, поскольку мы понимаем, что правовых оснований считать такое лицо администратором у нас uh, нет, sometimes, он подает какое-либо заявление, например, вот uh, because it was uh, done um, outside of the proper procedure, the domain was unregistered, and the second uh, registrant will then go to court or become a claimant. And we see a growing number in the number of such claims every year. Uh, there are several cases in which CCTLT was involved as a defendant, although we are a registry, not a registrar. And this new registrant also wants to collect damages together uh, from all the defendants. So they are not just looking to restore their rights. The cases that we analyzed were all denied by the court. Often, claimants claim that they entered into a purchase and sale agreement with the initial registrant, that they informed the registrar of the fact but the registrar failed to make an entry into the records. And what the courts say is that the claimants failed to provide any proof of them uh, complying with the established procedures that the registrant didn't, uh, the, the, the registrar did not have any uh, right to change the record in the registry. And even though the claimants uh, provide screenshots of emails, this, uh, these emails are not part of the established procedure, and therefore uh, they are not uh, considered to be local evidence. Another claim that the claimants make is that they kept paying for the domain names and uh, the courts are quite competent and they are saying that the claimant, even though they paid for the domain, this is not grounds enough for them to be considered uh, the valid owners of the domain, and often the courts write that the actual payment for the domain name by a third party is not uh, uh, evidence of the transfer of the right to administer to the third party. Now I'm quoting from different claims and from the court decisions. For instance, the claimant says that the defendants uh, dragged uh, the registration process in order to prevent the new registrant to register the domain name. Or 
также противоречит правилам. И вот мы после первого... Клеймент Uh, a certain uh, agreement was entered into by these parties, uh, so uh, th this agreement does not exist. The payment is, does not make up uh, an agreement of the transfer of the rights to administer. And the last one, the last item here is that when the claimants uh, quote from Article 6 and uh, 234 of the Civil Code, and I have to explain what this article uh, says. It um, speaks about also caption. Um, this is when uh, a lost and found uh, property can be considered owned by the new user if it's not claimed by the old user over a certain period of time. Again, this brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, the, like I said, the number of such cases is growing all the time. And it tells us that some uh, registrants do not fully realize the nature of the domain name and the nature of the agreement that they sign or the contract that they sign with the registrar. While the courts act competently, in 100% of cases, they deny the claim of the uh, claimants. Отказы в удовлетворении исковых требований. Но мы будем продолжать наблюдать, поскольку у нас еще есть несколько. Let's see what happens now. Um, when the court fees have been raised, there are several cases that are still going on, and we will keep monitoring them. Another topic that I want to bring up in this presentation is. Uh, um, Anti-legation of the domain names. Different government authorities, as part of their routine, will request information from the registries and registrars. They uh, often come up to us with requests to provide information about the names of the registrants. But when we share this data, we must comply with the uh, laws on personal data. There are many different authorities that can potentially request this information. The last item on the slide is the federal service of bailiffs, court bailiffs. From 2022, court bailiffs started to issue their own resolutions to suspend or to cancel registration of domain names. Here you can see that in just two years, uh, such decisions were taken um, with respect of 44 domain names, but in eight months of 2024, we have seen doubling of such resolutions of the bailiffs. CTLD that are used is certain uh, deficiencies in this practice. These resolutions are not uh, truly efficient. The debtors who engage in economic activity via websites when domain names are blocked, they have to stop this economic activity. They have to um, stop their business operations. 
как бы, да, возврата имущества и возврата долгов. And if they are not making any money, then there won't be much for the bailiffs to collect. Another risk is the risk of site damage, because sometimes the domain name supports not just the website, but also the corporate email, because as soon as the uh, domain name is undelegated, corporate email stops working, which is also not a good move, not a good uh, implication of such a resolution of a court bailiff. There is also high risk of uh, mistakes in April 2024, an erroneous resolution was issued to undelegate the main domain of the largest registrar of domain names in uh, .ru, in the .ru zone. It was a mistake to publish this resolution, but should anyone try to enforce it, the consequences could have been die. Fortunately, this um, resolution of the bailiffs was never enforced. And this practice is not compliant with the objectives that are stated in Article 3 of the law on enforcement of court decisions. One of these objectives is uh, ensuring integrity and safety of the property uh, that should be collected. Well, we believe that uh, the current practice of, co practice of court um, bailiffs does not meet this objective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ekaterina. I have a practical question. Oh, well, we have another question from the floor. I'll be quick, okay? If this is all right with you. So, Ekaterina, when the registry was a defendant in these cases, and you said that uh, you won all the cases, right? Have you ever tried collecting your own damages from the claimants? No, no, not yet, but we're thinking about it. Because sometimes the registrants are uh, really convinced that they are valid registrants. And of course, there are abuses. So we'll have to differentiate between the good faith claimants and the bad faith claimants. Okay, got it. Thank you. Okay. Yes, sure, 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 sure. Elizaveta, yes, please, uh, go ahead. As a representative of the registrar, this year we received uh, many more uh, decisions or resolutions of bailiffs. We are getting 10 to 20 resolutions of the bailiffs per week. And it's not the registrant uh, who is listed as the uh, respondent. You see, oh, uh, sometimes we would get a resolution with wrong names. So on the one hand, we must comply with the resolution of the bailiff, but uh, then we see that they've made a mistake. And um, I mean, it's, uh, it, it's always... Um, a very awkward situation for us. Now, with respect to beliefs, we um, prepared a memo that we submitted to the government. The registry is doing its best, and we are. Um, uh, we are doing our best uh, to, uh, to fix the situation. Вот, то 
тогда, по крайней мере, хоть дорогу можно будет взять. А вот регистраторы, которые судятся, им вполне возможно... The um, litigant registrars can hire lawyers for the defense. Even if they have their own lawyers on staff, they can still hide outside lawyers and collect the damages. And I know some registrars who are already doing this, and they, uh, they use this right. So these court trolls, uh, they suffer for their trolling. Can I add something? Uh, there is this project that we run to um, collect uh, debt from the uh, uh, telecom subscribers. So again, there is this project to create pools of such requests that could be processed jointly for a fixed fee, uh, for a fixed lawyer's fee. Okay, got it. Thank you very much. Uh, Natalia, did you want to add something? Yes, my comment is on the transfer of the right to administer the name. I don't understand how a new registrant may claim that the registrar fails to act properly. For us to transfer the right to administer a domain name, two parties should take specific actions. You can't have registrant number two unless registrant number one took certain actions. So you have to open the current account of the, I mean, the, you have to use the personal account of the current um, registrant to uh, submit uh, the request to transfer, and then the second, the new registrant needs to use their uh, personal account um, through which a re-registration request should also be supplied. So two requests should be coming to us. What about you? Well, um, it's a similar algorithm for us. On one of my slides, I described the improper procedure, and I said that this is this is how it sometimes happens, but it's outside of the law. It's not a lawful procedure, what they are doing. It's not the real second registrant, because both parties fail to comply with the procedure. Even if the first registrant submitted uh, some request to the registrar, but uh, this was done in freestyle, in a free form, outside of the established you know, format. Even if both parties took certain actions, but these were not the authorized actions, the courts will not rule in favor of these registrants. Even if there is an email that the first registrant sends to us, but it's not the application form, that the registrant should fill out in accordance with our policy, in accordance with the contract that this first registrant has with us, then there is no registrant number two. We'll never uh, perceive that registrant as a lawful holder of the rights to the, the, the domain name. We have one more question. I'm with that Moscow, that Moscow. I have a question about UTRP. When you submit your complaint in a certain language, and your defendant also speaks this language, then a special pool of arbitrators 
will consider this case. All complaints in Russian are considered today or are tried today but by people from unfriendly countries. They are assigned to arbitrators from unfriendly countries. And I would prefer a national court in this case. Uh, very well, as you uh, well know, um, there are three opinions between two lawyers, and every time legal uh, session comes up with several solutions to the same issue. Now I suggest that we um, give the floor to Alina Akinshina. She is the general director of online patent company. She will talk about online services uh, to check and protect trademarks. Good afternoon, colleagues. I will walk you quickly through the methods that will simplify and facilitate the procedure of acquiring rights to trademarks by the persons who are acting as registrants of domain names. Online patent.ru is a specialized digital platform to automate the process of checking registration of trademarks and their subsequent administration, uh, i.e. Uh, keeping the register, making transactions, and uh, doing other things that registrars do with respect to registries, national registries. It's an online service uh, for Ross Patent and other national authorities. We offer digital services uh, to run checks, due diligence checks um, on trademarks. The process is automated, and IP owners can administer trademarks in their personal accounts online. I will turn to disputes a bit later. Because I understand there may be conflicts between trademarks and domain names. However, in the last five years and today, in the trademark registration market, which is the root of all subsequent conflicts, we have been observing a surge in activity. The market almost doubled in the last five years. It's growing at an accelerated rate. You can see how much it added in 2023, 133,000 applications to register versus 98,000 back in 2022. One of the contributors to this surge was the amendments to the law. From June 2023, you can now register the trademarks in the name of individuals, which is a major innovation. It's an innovation to connect a trademark and a domain name. 75% of registrants are individuals, and at the same time, these individuals could not register trademarks in their own name. But now this barrier is removed and this jump in registrations in 2023 is explained by the removal of this barrier. As more applications flood in, we also notice another trend. There are so many trademarks around. There is almost a million, 900,000, 900 plus thousand uh, uh, trademarks that are active. 12 to 13,000 applications are submitted every month, which makes the whole registration process very complicated. As a result, the most typical problem that uh, registrants have to face 
Together with other market participants who would like to uh, register certain designations as trademarks is the problem of late priority. There is another budget consideration as well. To register a domain name as a rule, unless it's a unique domain name of high value, then to register a domain name you need hundreds, maybe thousands of rubles, but not dozens of uh, thousands of rubles. But to register a trademark, if you just take into account the current fees and duties, that's at least 30,000 of rubles. We know that four duties are uh, being raised, and the duties of Ross Patent will also be raised pretty soon. The duties will be increased by about 50%. That means that the cost of registering a trademark will become even higher. Hence the problem of late priority. A small business or a startup registers a domain name but doesn't register a trademark because they're not sure what will come out of this uh, or come off uh, come off this company. And while colleagues are still thinking about the concept of their future enterprise, uh, sometimes uh, it happens, and it, actually it happens quite often. There are professional uh, participants of the trademark market, and in recent years the market has grown. Uh, through individuals, they will apply to register this trademark and they will wait for the startup to mature. Uh, for the business to, uh, you know, grow enough to buy back uh, that trademark. So what can be done about this is remove barriers uh, for the market participants in terms of accelerated registration of trademarks, fast track reg registration. It's pretty difficult to automate the process of communication with Ross Patent. We've been working hard for many years uh, to facilitate the procedure. And just this year, we managed to automate this interaction with Ross Patent to a high degree. And now, with the data, well, actually, if you take domain names, then uh, it's the uh, uh, actual description, the textual description, then data of, of the uh, individual, individual entrepreneur, legal entity. This is all the data that you need in order to uh, apply to register a trademark. And then there is also a service uh, to reserve a trademark uh, in your name. As you register a domain name, you can at the same time submit an application to register a domain name. And in the next six months, while you are waiting for the duty, uh, while you are waiting to pay um, the duty, you have six months actually to pay the duty. Uh, while you are taking business decisions, uh, you are collecting data about uh, your own prospects, well, then you will be able to decide to, to convert or not to convert this application into a um, full-scale application for a trademark. And this is when you pay on um, the duty and you select the uh, classes for registration. So the problem of late priority will thus be removed. And the tool that is unfortunately used the most today by the professional participants of the market who make money on reselling of the applications will be available, will be made available to a larger audience. Another service that succeeds the re reservation of the trademark service is the uh, service to protect the domain name. Say a uh, user is not yet ready to take um, a uh, conscious decision about uh, its own business. And then the user can select the classes that are most likely to succeed 
the user will be able to register the trademark just in these classes. To protect the domain name. My colleagues that think have already convinced everyone that the domain name is a valuable asset. Sometimes domain names are not involved in any particular business activity, but they are still maintained, uh, they are upheld, uh, just in case. If the user is ready to determine the target uh, registration class, then this can become a full-time legal service. You can engage uh, uh, patent officers and complete the registration. These services have already been implemented. There is full search and check on the domain name across databases of trademarks either registered or or, or the, the ones that can be registered under Madrid um, rules, then you can also submit applications under certain criteria through the automatic submission of applications to Ross Patent Service, and there is e-workflow. This kind of automation accelerates the acquisition of the rights to trademarks and minimizes the risks of trolling. I don't know, colleagues, whether you have to face that in your domain uh, names practice, but in the trademark field, this has become systemic. The applications are submitted not by the actual persons who are interested in protecting uh, the trademark. Often we receive applications from those who are looking to create a market of resellers. Another thing is, yeah, uh, lowering the barriers to entry, the size of duties that will come into effect after the amendments to the government regulation is adopted could become prohibitive to small businesses to register, to, or rather to pay 50, 60,000 rubles for the registration of potential trademark uh, can be quite expensive. Besides, sometimes businesses are not sure what will be their main business at the stage of startup. They can't pay for registrations in many classes, but they can book these classes, they can make a reservation. We are also thinking about similar solutions for the authorities of neighboring countries. We believe that technically these solutions are quite uh, possible. They can be implemented in uh, our neighboring countries. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alina. I have an idea. I think that you have um, excellent grounds to collaborate with uh, registrars. IP rights holders uh, want to register trademarks. They know how to do it, they know why they are doing it, but domain name registrants, uh, well, most people know that they are not uh, IP 
uh, objects. And I'm thinking that uh, maybe you can collaborate with um, registrants, but registrants used to check for the availability of domain names. You can, they can also check their availability in terms of trademark registration. Well, patent trolling is a lot of pressure on the market. So, yeah, I think that this can be a good solution to protect the rights of good faith registrants. Uh, yes, we are looking to make the services available to a broader audience. Very well, last but not least, Irina. Yeah. And now, for the first time here the, in the legal session, we are going to discuss not courts, not rulings, not uh, settlement policies. Let's take a look at the CCNSO policy development. Irina, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, actually, you will see that uh, my presentation has a rightful place. Uh, in this session, because we'll be talking about courts, we'll be talking about the rules of registration of the second tier domain names. But if you go uh, one level up, the top level domains, um, then certain rules apply to them as well. And these rules describe uh, the procedure of uh, uh, how these domain names are entered into the IANA uh, database and the rules, how the changes are made to the IANA records. A new uh, top-level domain can be registered. Well, it's not regi registration. In this case, it's delegation. And uh, a TLD can be transferred to a different registry, and uh, the TLD can be removed from the IANA database, just like it happens with lower-level domain names. TLDs are governed by certain policies. CCNSO is an organization that develops these policies. It's a country code uh, support organization. Its policies are, or rather, this, the, the very fact of existence of this organization is part of the uh, um, IANA uh, policy. You have to understand that the um, policies applying to uh, country code domains are developed by the representatives of CCTLDs, uh, the representatives of CCTLDs in the CCNSO, and these policies, these rules are not aimed at um, registries. They are not targeting registries. They describe rather how IANA should make changes in the records in the root zone. When I say IANA, I'm going to use this word. I will mean the legal entity which is called PTI, which um, exercises one of the three functions of IANA, which is um, keeping the database of um, maintaining the database of uh, CCTLDs. Now, what are these policies that apply to CCTLDs? RFC 1591 is still considered to be the most fundamental of them. It was um, developed in 1994 by John Postel. It was later interpreted in 2013 uh, in a document that's called the Framework of Interpretation. After that, there were several CCNSO um, documents, and two of these policies are not yet approved by the ICANN board. And it may seem that uh, all these aspects of delegation and transfer have uh, retirement and uh, uh, revocation of uh, CCTLDs and ITNs. It, it may seem that all of this must have been already described fully to the extreme. But then it turns out that no, it's not the case. Uh, that in the set of policies there are gaps and 
there are situations, practical situations, when Ayana is at a loss. And it doesn't know what to do, because the policies um, do not prescribe any specific course of action. One such situation happened last year, and it triggered the uh, setting up of a new task force and a new round of discussions around CCNSO policies. Are these policies sufficient? Is it okay to refer to a dozen different documents uh, when you need to find solution for one specific matter? Or should we um, have a kind of a codex? Or should we have additional policies? I will give you some examples to make uh, the uh, whole um, situation clearer. Now, here is a hypothetical case number one. The Democratic Republic of Finistria is a small territory in the Atlantic Ocean. It has a population of 300,000 people. It's country code is that why and since time immemorial it was managed by one Vista. Mr. Vista writes to Ayana that he's tired to manage this CCTLD. He would prefer to retire, do gardening and he is happy to transfer the administration of this domain name to anyone. But he would prefer to do it no later than the 31st of October 2024. He wants to retire. The question is, what do we do? Well, what do you think? Who is going to get the domain? Who should be getting the domain? A competition? A contest? Now, who should organize this contest? He doesn't want to do anything. He is tired. No, Mr. Vista, a gentleman. No, he's a, he's a real person, and uh, Ayana offices called Mr. Vista, made sure that uh, he's the one who he claims to be. Ayana should collect this uh, domain name, a competition, what else? Ask the government of the Democratic Republic of Finestra. Ask Mr. Vista. Okay. You see how many options uh, are out there, but the current policy, the formal policy, only describes a situation, a scenario, where we have a current registrant, or CCTLD manager, let's put, call him that. There is a new CCTLD manager, and they agree between themselves in an amicable uh, matter on the transfer of the domain name. But if there is no new manager, uh, well, the policy is silent on that. Okay, how about another potential scenario? Mr. Vista died. He passed away yesterday. And he left no will. He died and tested. This is going to be a domain dispute between who and who? A transit registry at Ayana? What if uh, Mr. Vista left a will? What if there is a will? The last will. Yes, 
Не, ну это то, о чем мы сегодня говорили, да, про наследование. То есть у нас нет какого-то здесь однозначного ответа то, точно, то есть мы можем только фантазировать на эту тему. Это вот опять же, да, он умер. Last will and testament. Well, it's something that we talked about today. What, do we have successors? If there are no successors, then what happens? Uh, should it be the government? Do he, do he leave uh, any descendants? Maybe indirect descendants? Give it in the hands of the government? Well, what if the government doesn't want to take it? Because not all governments want to take it. Well, probably in the current political situation, probably, yes, the government will be happy to get it hands on the domain names. But, uh, okay, in this scenario, the government refuses to accept uh, this uh, inheritance. Но мне кажется, что до недавнего времени еще были, да, еще, еще есть. Дмитрий есть. Кахманюк у нас Украина, пожалуйста. Дмитрий Кахманюк, Украин. Дмитрий Кахманюк. UA, uh, he is the he is the case here. He is uh, administering that UA. Okay, here is another case. Data accuracy uh, in the root zone database. Uh, there is a fictional record for that PO in the IANA database. The manager of the CCTLT is a university. Pablo's University. The administrative contact is someone Pablo, Pablo at registry.po, and the technical contact is missing in the tech, in the um, IANA database. Well, generally, IANA knows that it's no longer Pablo who is responsible uh, for this uh, university's domain. It's Isabella. But they were never notified officially. Ayana knows about that from some unofficial uh, sources. We know that uh, Isabella now has a different office, she has a different uh, phone number, and then that PO wants to change information about name servers in the Ayana database. According to the current procedure, Ayana is going to send all the instructions to the contact details that are identified in the Ayana database, but the CCTLD manager's details are no longer relevant. They are not updated. What do we do? What do we do? Go to court. Go to court. Get them to court. The domain name? Well, if you don't change the information about the name server in the IANA database, then the domain, the CCTLD will stop working. Can you believe that? It will stop working for the whole country, for the world. What does IANA do? We are talking about the CCTLD. Well, IANA should have made provisions for that. You should have a policy. Okay. And we can't sanction them. We can't put pressure on them. Exactly. It's a recommendation. The uh, CCTLDs uh, are urged to update uh, information in the database, but if they fail to update their details, details, then there are no sanctions. They will not be punished. IANA doesn't have um, the authority to uh, punish the CCTLD. Remove the domain for what? On which grounds? Well, it's not a case of succession. It's not a case of inheritance. I know that.
Мистер Виста получил домен в тот момент, когда господин Джон Пастель раздавал домены, записывая эти сведения в свои well, клетчатые тетрадки. Мистер Виста получил домен, когда Джон Пастель раздавал домены, записывая эти сведения в своих клетчатых тетрадках. Мистер Виста получил домен, когда Сейчас я закончу про... Собственно, вот это были примеры... So basically, these are the cases that demonstrate the gaps, the white spots in the IANA policies that were identified recently. IANA made a list of such cases in, on three pages. Over here, you can just see the topics uh, or categories where we have certain practical issues. As to how to approach these issues, well, is it a gap because there is no policy or is it a gap because there is no guidance on how to interpret the policy? So now um, a working group was established, Svetla Banova and myself are members of this uh, working group. If you are interested, all uh, working group uh, meetings and all these materials are open to the public. And here is our page. So to go back to LB, .lb domain name, the Lebanon um, domain name of Lebanon CCTLD, the person who was um, recorded as the manager uh, of the CCTLD passed away uh, suddenly. And this is the decision that was taken by Anna. Anna uh, acted as uh, a uh, caretaker, uh, the caretaker operator. The actual operations on the domain, it was serviced by third parties, and they were known to Anna. And after that, a formal procedure was launched to appoint a new CCTLT manager through consultations with the stakeholders. But, I mean, this is how it happened, but it happened, uh, it was a kind of an improvisation. We had to add lib, you know, it happened because we did not have a proper procedure in place. Thank you very much, Irina. It means that anyone who has ideas on how to resolve such cases can contact you, and then you will be able to communicate these ideas to your broader community. Well, yes, you, you can contact me, uh, yeah, or you can send your, submit your ideas directly to the working group. Well, thank you very much. That's good news. And uh, thank you for attending this session. It was my pleasure to moderate it. We had amazing speakers. Uh, you are now uh, free to go uh, to lunch and see you back in about an hour. Let's have a round of applause to the speakers and to the moderators.